Hello, my name is Jeff Carter of McLean Photographic and I'm a professional sports photographer shooting with the Fujifilm X series. I've been a professional photographer for 25 years, specialising in sport, more specifically motorsport, although I've shot many other sports at national and international level, including rugby and canoe slalom. My clients include the FIA, the world governing body of motorsport, for whom I work on the World Endurance Championship and the European Historic Sporting Rally Championship, and also the Automobile Club de West, the ACO, for whom I work at the 24 Hours Le Mans and the European Le Mans series. Since 2014, I've shot exclusively with Fujifilm, having moved from Nikon, and since 2015, I had the privilege of being an official Fujifilm X photographer. Over the next 45 minutes, I'm going to talk about some of the tricks of my trade, and more specifically, how I use the Fujifilm X series to get the results that my clients love. I've covered many aspects of motorsport, um, but spe my specialty is, is sports cars and rally. Over the years, I've covered many other genres, such as autographs and motorbikes, but I love capturing sports cars and rally cars. The good thing about shooting motorsport is the fans are actively encouraged to take cameras into the venue, even top events like Le Mans and, and Formula One. You try taking a camera into, into Wembley or Twickenham and you won't be allowed. Simple as that. So for amateur sports photographers, motorsport can offer a lot of opportunities. I'm going to give you some top tips. My top tip, my number one top tip is know your subject. Okay, doesn't matter what gear you got, know your subject. If you know the subject, you can read the, read the action. If you can read the action, you can anticipate. It's really important when you're working. It will help you capture better images. If you know what's happening on the field, on the track, or whatever sport you're shooting, that's the thing to do is to know your subject. So get onto YouTube. If you don't know the sport, get onto YouTube, check out some of the action, see where the photographers are sitting, that sort of thing, but know your subject beforehand. My second tip is know your gear. It's like driving a car. If you, know, if you drive a car, um, you just do it. You, when you're learning to drive, you, you're thinking about your gear changing, you're thinking about the steering wheel, you're thinking about the controls. But once you've been driving for a while, you don't need to worry about that because it's automatic. You just do it um, when you're driving. The same with camera gear. If you know your camera gear, you're not fiddling with the knobs and the buttons and everything else. You're just shooting. You're just out there and you're concentrating on what's in front of you, not what's happening on your camera gear. So know your camera gear and know your subject. The best things to get better pictures. So working at an event. Um, well, I do a lot of planning. Before I go, I do a lot of planning. Now, there's two types of venues. Either I've been there before or I haven't. If it's a new venue, I've got to do a lot of research, um, checking out other photographers, see what they've done, um, where they got the pictures from, checking out where the light's going to be. So TPS is a really good app that I've got on my phone, checking out where the sunrise, sunset is at certain times of year. Um, but it, more importantly, is just do as much research as I possibly can. If I've been there before, I look at what I did previously and see what I can improve on before I go and see if there's anything changed um, on the internet. So internet's a great useful tool. Um, once I get, well, so getting there. Now, if it's in the UK, obviously I travel by car. If I'm going abroad, I tend to fly. Now, flying is a pain when you're traveling with lots of gear. Now, my hand, whole bag, baggage, I put things like lights, tripods, that sort of thing in, the, in my whole bag, baggage, but in my backpack all goes all my camera gear. I do not put anything in the in anything in my camera gear in the hold. It gets, it gets thrown around by the baggage handlers. They have a job to do. Even a well-protected pelly case or something is a chance your stuff's going to get damaged, so I don't want to put it in the hold. So I have a backpack that fits the dimensions of the airline that I'm fitting, I'm flying with, so it fits their rules, and I put everything I can in there. Some airlines fly, check the weight, most of the airlines don't, um, but you need to make sure whichever airline you're flying with, you meet their checking bag, yeah, check and baggage rules. Um, I tend to fly with flag carriers like British Airways or with Air France, so uh, there's a bit more flexibility. If you're flying with Ryanair or EasyJet or one of the budget air, other budget airlines, you are going to be really restricted. So check out before you take any cameras on the on the plane. Um, on arrival, I tend to I go for a track walk. Um, I go for a walk around the venue. If I've been there before, I go and check out where you know what I did last year. See if anything's changed. The new curbs, new new track, new asphalt have been put down. Um, talk to the drivers. See what they thought. Um, also see the, where the red zones are. The red zones are no shoot zones, they're danger zones, so we're not allowed to shoot from those areas. 
And the other thing I tend to do is I have a shoot list now, but I keep it flexible. What I do is I have a, shoot, a, a list of all the shots I need to get for the weekend, but I, I try to keep it flexible so I can adapt my uh, schedule if I need to, if things happen or something changes, um, which does quite a lot. Also keep an eye on the weather. Um, if you're a spectator and it starts pouring with rain, you can pack up and go home. If you're a professional, you can't do that. You've got to carry on shooting. So um, you make sure you've got your you know, keep an eye on the weather, make sure your clo your clothing is fit for purpose because if you're wet or you're cold, you're not gonna be shooting at your best. So um, make sure you've got the, the correct clothes for the weather that's thing. I've shot in the desert, I've shot in snow, I've shot in rain and I've shot in sunshine. So it just really doesn't, um, I, I just adapt what I'm doing accordingly. Um, but just because a camera has got WR on the, on the lens or on the body, don't assume that it's waterproof. It's water resistant, not waterproof. Also, it's dust proof. Um, in the desert, I tend to take three cameras and three lenses uh, to cover what I need. Wide angle zoom, short telephoto zoom, and a 200mm f2. Um, I don't want to be changing lenses in the desert because of the dust. So I tend to take three bodies, three cameras, three lenses, um, and don't have to change lenses when I'm working out on a dusty location. Uh, same with wet weather, you need to be the same. So um, just to, just check out what you're gonna be working in. As I say, it's amazing how many people just pack up and go home, but we professionals cannot do that. So where do I shoot from? Um, now, I've if you go to a motorsport event as a spectator, you are limited, but there are certain venues where you can shoot um, you, pretty well, like Snetterton, Mallory Park, uh, Alton Park, you do have a lot of options as a spectator because there's low fences. Now, here's a shot, this was taken at Snetterton a few years ago, of spectators, and I'm in the media area, so I'm right in front of that, that fence, um, and I'm looking out onto the, onto the track. So the, the spectators have got nearly as good a shot, a, a position as I've got behind the fence, behind the Arco barrier. So somewhere like Snetterton you can actually shoot really well. Sometimes as a professional I will actually go into the spectator area especially those high banking or there's trees or something like that I can shoot through. We will go into the spectator areas and shoot from different locations and then go back to the immediate side. So sometimes the spectator areas offer better locations for some shots than you can get trackside. So um, think about that. If you go somewhere like Silverstone or Brands Hatch or Donington Park, you are gonna be limited because of the fact that you've got lots of high fences, but you can find locations where you can shoot over the fence. Also think of the, the event you're going to. If you're going to go to a Formula One event, you are gonna be strictly limited where you can go and what you can do. It's playing with British touring cars, British GT, not so much the national level, but you still have a restriction. You're gonna have some restrictions. If you go to a club meeting, you're gonna have a lot of freedom because there's gonna be a few hundred spectators in normal times. At the moment, we've got no spectators because of COVID, but normally you'd have a few hundred spectators and that's it. But if you go to a British touring car event, you are gonna have a lot of people there. Um, so, and, and Formula One, same again, World, World Endurance Championship, you're gonna have more people. Um, so you will be limited by the number of people that are there. So, but here's a shot I did of a, through the thing, as it's netting and again, you can see what, what I'm talking about. You can get really good shots um, trackside at certain club circuits. And that's a British GT event as well. So nice cars, that's a Lamborghini. So we're talking about techniques now. Um, freezing the action. Um, right, this is, we tend to, some people just go, go trackside or go into the spectator areas, stick their camera on 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 a second, 15 frames a second, and just carry on shooting and just get thousands of shots, same corner. And yeah, you're gonna get some reasonable shots. You might even get the old good one, but your portfolio is gonna look really boring. Okay, so, you know, some people are happy doing that. I don't tend to be subscribed to that thing. Now, this shot was done at 2,000 a second. This one was done in Bahrain, but you can see I've framed it slightly differently. And also I've chosen a corner where the car is turning into the corner. So it's lifting. And I've also got all the heat haze as well on the, on the, on the car coming out the, out the back of the car. Now they say it's in Bahrain, so it's hot anyway. Um, it was in December, so it wasn't so hot, about 26 degrees. Uh, it was quite nice for, for, for us Brits, you know, 26 degrees in December, but um, for Bahrain, I've been out there and it's been 50 degrees and it's been very hot. Um, but no, this is, um, 
this will be a, a far shorter speed. What I tend to do is, if it's coming towards me, the car's coming towards me, I will use a high shutter speed where I can't see the wheels. Now the wheels are the important things. The problem is, if you use a far shutter speed and you freeze the wheels, the car looks like it's parked on track. If you shoot air shows, it's the same thing. Um, if you shoot propeller aircraft or helicopters and you shoot a high shutter speed, you've got frozen props and it looks like the car, the plane's going to fall out of the sky, or the helicopter's going to fall out of the sky. Same thing with, with cars. If the car, the wheels aren't turning, it looks like it's parked on track. Now, these cars are doing 150 to 200 miles an hour in certain places. Now, you want to show that speed. You can't show that speed if the, if the wheels are frozen. So, where you can't see the wheels like this, they can't see the side, of the, side, side walls where we've got the logos on them, this is the type of shot I would use a high shutter speed. Um, whereas if the car was side on, I would have used a slower shutter speed, maybe 500 of a second or 320, 400 of a second, just to give that to get a little bit of movement in the wheel. Um, because it's head on, I can go higher than that and get this frozen image. Here's another free action freezing shot. This is at night at Sebring in Florida. Um, you can see the cars now. The autofocus on the on the car on the XT series is now really really good. Um, it does used to struggle with cars going away. When it's cars coming towards you, or a subject was coming towards the car, it would pick it up and no problems at all. The XT4 and now the XT3 have got a much better algorithm for cars going away. I found it to have improved, so you can actually track a car going away, which is un which is a great thing for me to be able to do because a lot of corners, you're you're shooting, you want to get this rear shot which is what I've done here. So you can see the cars are going around the corner. You've got three or four cars in that train of cars going through there and the curb hopping. So and in, obviously the Porsche is lit by the, by the headlights of the, of the Corvette following it. So um, yeah, it's again, it would be a high, as high as I could get. Obviously we're at night there, but again, we've got a lot of ambient light being thrown around. This is another shot. This is in Japan. This is Fuji Speedway, and they're coming up a hill towards me. So again, it's come, I'm getting slightly lower so I can get along the track, getting down as low as I can behind the barrier to shoot along the track. I never, you never go outside the barriers. You never go, and you never go put your cameras over the barriers. You're shooting from behind the barriers at all times. Um, so this shot was again. You can see it's it's a high shutter speed um f2 on the f2.8 on the on the 200 f2 with the 1.4 converter fitted so you've got the nice background out of focus the car behind is also out of focus and you've got this i'm, I'm follow focusing on the autofocus here coming the car coming towards me on the the prototype so then we come on to a technique called panning now you may have heard of this before it's basically uh, panning is where you follow the car um, with the camera and as you shoot as you're going through it's a bit like a golf swing apart from the, the golf swing is up you tend to shoot perpendicular to the or parallel uh, on on the horizontal sorry going along so you're shooting uh, following the car and you're shooting as you go through a certain point now I shoot a high rate so you've got the high rate set on the on the camera and I shoot two or three shots as going through you, need to, you follow the car through boom, 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 and then next car boom, boom, boom. now what I tend to do is focus on I put the focus um, square on the number panel as you can see our cars got big number panels so they're quite easy to that's the point you try and keep the the square on that number panel so the car is always in the same place in the frame as you're moving through you try and keep if you move it it's going to blur so you want to be through the follow it through and keeping the frame the car in the frame at the same point so you need to have a certain point on the car that you're focusing on trying to keep in the same place um, so this is at Portimao in Portugal last weekend for the European Le Mans series this is the Le Mans Cup the one of the support series that I work on um, but this is where they ran the Formula One race in Portugal a few weeks ago it's a beautiful circuit, like a roller coaster. So we're up high on the top of the hill, and you've got all the all the track behind you as well. Um, so this was done at about one twenty fifth of a second. Now one twenty fifth is my go to. You know, I can get ninety nine percent of my shots sharp. I won't say hundred um, percent. It actually it's about ninety percent. Two fifty of a second, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it, I can get hundred percent. I'll say ninety nine because the odd shot will get think get book up. I'll miss it for some reason, but. At 125th, I'm talking about nine, nine out of ten, maybe 9.5 out of ten. Um, it's my go-to, so I can get all the shots that I need with a nice bit of blur, 
behind. It depends how fast the cars are going as well, um, how much blur you get, because obviously the slower the car, the less blur you're going to get, because to do the same, it won't be travelling as far in that while well, the shutter's open. So you need to also work out if it's a really slow sh slow corner or a slow part of the track, you need to um, make it make the shutter speed longer um, so you can make it uh, get more blur. But we'll go through that. But this is normally 125th is my go-to. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show you a sequence of shots I did it in the 24 hours of Le Mans in September, specifically to demonstrate what the um, different shutter speeds do. All right, so this is the last corner at Le Mans. This is the uh, module sportif, the building in the background. Um, and this is this last corner. And so I've shot a sequence of shot at this corner to show you how blurred the background for certain shutter speeds. Now this isn't a fast corner, it's a second part of a chicane, but they try and carry as much speed through the corner before they go back onto the main straight here and up the hill towards the Dunlop Bridge. They try to keep coming through here about 80 miles an hour, 6, 70, 80 miles an hour through here. So it's not that fast for these cars, because they say these cars are doing 200 miles an hour. Um, but um, it's a fairly medium medium corner. So this is 250th, you can see the car's pretty sharp, the wheels are turning, you can see blur in the wheels, um, and then the, the background is slightly blurred as well. Um, but that 250th, 99% of the time I'll get that sharp, 100, maybe 100, but 99. Next shot is at 125th, which is my go-to. Again, I've got the thing, the background is more blurred, but the, the car is, is sharp the wheels are moving even more but you can still see the Goodyear logos on them they're they are still moving they're not completely round it's not completely yellow yet but you can see the background is more blurred um, you can't see the logos on the Rolex bridge there anymore um, they're blurred you can't read them if you didn't know it's Rolex you probably wouldn't know so you get more sense of speed with that shot. Next is 60th of a second now 60th of a second we're starting to get a lot of blur the good thing about using the panning technique is this year, as I said earlier, we have no spectators at our events, which is a pain when you're trying to show, you know, we normally try and show spectator crowded grandstands because we have lots of spectators, especially at Le Mans, we're 250,000 people at Le Mans. Um, so we try to show busy grandstands, lots of people, people enjoying themselves, that sort of thing. Here this year, it was a very strange event. This was my 10th uh, Le Mans that I'd done and it's the strangest that I've ever done. So the grandstands are empty. So if you use a panning technique, you can get rid of the. No, you can see there. You can see the grandstands. They look. They don't look as empty as if it was a static or less blurred shot. So it's also a good shot. A good technique for doing for that. So the next shot is the thirtieth of second. Now this is normally the lowest I will go um, because you're starting to get a hit rate of one in ten. Um, one in maybe two in ten. I'm I'm pretty good at thirtieth, but I, I'm still thinking. So what I've done is with well, the one twenty fifth, I've got all the shots that I need. So the banker shots are in. The thing. So these are when I start getting arty. So if I've got the time, I can then start lowering the shutter speed and being more arty with it. But I am gonna. I know my hit rate's gonna go down. But you can see the background is a lot more blurred now. The car's still sharp. Um, the car is front and back is still sharp, so it's pretty good. Um, but the background is definitely going more more blurred. And you get more sense of speed. Next is a fifteenth of a second. Now the cars are going slightly away from me, so if they're like the first shot I showed you, where the car is parallel, you'll get front and back, and everything will be sharp. If they're going away from you or coming towards you, certain parts of the car will be will be blurred. If you're this at fifteenth of a second, thirtieth of a second, you will get blurring. Um, it doesn't matter as long as something on the car is sharp. Like here, it's the Rebellion, the three lights, um, the, the whole, this part of the car is sharp. Front and back is gone. doesn't matter. You get this sense of speed um, thing. So the 15th of a second, I'm getting one in, maybe two in 20, one in 20. It's that sort of shutter speed, that, that sort of hit rate. So I only do this when I've got time. The next is eighth. Now, we are getting to the extreme end of the thing. You can see the module sportif is completely gone. The car itself is very blurred, but again, it gives you this beautiful sense of speed because all the lines now have gone coloured. You can see the lines are going coloured, so you get this warp speed effect. So, it, again, it doesn't really matter the car is blurred. Um, certain parts of the car are okay, but the main it's, it's all about sense of speed, which is what this is doing. In the, which is what an eighth of a second does. But again, you're talking one in 20. 
it's it's a very very difficult and i've had years of practice of this it is all about practice you're not going to pick a camera and do this straight away you might get lucky but it's not going to happen straight away you need to be able to practice 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 with this start if you want to start panning start at 250th get it right nail it get it get your technique right and then bring it down um, slowly now the next shot is something i did a few two years ago sorry last year 2019 le mans which is a quarter of a second now this looks like a double exposure i did not use flash i don't use flash um, the reason I don't use flash for two reasons. A, the cars are usually too far away. Even with the high power guns, they're too far away. And the other thing is, if you're too close, uh, it, it can really put the drivers off. Um, especially if you are close enough to use flash, um, you've got to be careful you don't throw light into the cockpit and, and disturb the driver. Because if he crashes, he's going to come after you with a wheel wrench or whatever, because you know he's just crashed his car and spoiled his race. So I don't tend to use flash for that reason. But this looks like I have used a, a bit of you know um, rear curtain sink but it's all about ambient light i've got a car following behind to put a bit of light in i've got all this light behind i always choose my locations for when i'm when i'm doing um this sort of tech thing i'm always looking for pools of light we'll talk about shooting at night later but you're looking for the light where it's going to give the most dramatic effect so i've got behind you've got all the lights in the in the grandstands etc before um and so you've got all this ambient light being thrown around so it's very much a thing and this is a quarter of a second i have gone down lower than that but it, again the hit rate is ridiculous so i don't tend to do it unless i'm i say i've got plenty of time and i'm trying to be arty the other thing i try to do when i'm doing panning shots is to try and get a crossover now this is one of my favorite techniques um it's a good tip actually um this is a 40 the second this is in japan the first corner coming down to turn two um at fuji speedway now you can see the cars are going right to left behind but the car is going left to right in foreground so what you're doing you're following this car so as it's coming around the corner you're following it but the cars behind are going in the opposite opposite direction so the blurring effect is even more dramatic because the cars are going in the opposite direction so say so this is a 40th of a second i know that because it's one of my favorite shots Again, you can see the front of the car, the Ford, the EcoBoost, the Michelin, that's sharp. The rest of the car is gone. But it, again, it doesn't matter because it's showing the speed of the car through that corner, um, which is a very quick corner um, for those cars. And you've got the car behind, which is completely blurred because you can see the cars going. That car is actually going slightly right to left as well as it's coming around that corner. So again, you've got that blurring effect. It's a very good technique. So the crossover is something I use a lot. Next technique is shooting high and low. Whenever I'm shooting, I try to get higher or low because we, as photographers, we tend to shoot at the same level, at eye level. So standing up, eye level, taking the shot. Now, that can look sometimes, it, it works, but it can look boring. So you're trying to mix up a little bit. So trying to get higher or lower is, a, is a, usually a good technique. So as I said earlier, I will go into the spectator areas and, um, and shoot from the spectator areas, either grandstands or on the spectator banking to get a different shot through the trees is a good shot. This is, um, this is taken at Sebring, at the ho this is the hotel at the circuit in Florida. Um, and the, we're on a platform. They've built a platform for photographers to use, not professional photographers not the uh, not spectators but you can shoot down onto the cars now this is taken on a 10 24 wide angle zoom i tend to i love that love that lens i love shooting wide angle because we're a world championship we have to show where we are in the world so i tend to use wide angle a lot to get some just to have the car small in the frame like this one to show a bit of where we are um you know around the world so this was a pan shot probably a 30 of the second panning's easier with the wide angles than it is with telephotos because you've got the more um is the because the subject's smaller in the frame but no again i was shooting i also use uh, an nd grad um, i use filters a lot um so to control the light coming into the lens because obviously the, the thing i did get a didn't get any flare i use you use high-end filters so you try to co control the flare coming into the thing but i do like using backlit um subjects as well so that's it that's that and also getting down low now this is actually a gfx 100 with 110 mil f2 i don't have a gfx i've borrowed a gfx a couple of times it's a great pit lane camera but it's not very good for trackside so um the new gfx 100 is actually better but we you haven't got the long lenses a 250 f4 is okay but it's not 
a sports lens like the 200mm f2 or the 100-400. So I tend to stick with the X-Series for trackside work and in the pit lane I'll usually shoot obviously with my X-Series but if I get the opportunity to borrow a GFX I will take it and I had the 110. The files are just stunning, absolutely stunning. You know this, you know, this shot here, I've got a load of shots like this. Um, but you can see the effect with the F2, it's wide open, you've got this wonderful fall off because I've put the camera down low and you've got this wonderful fall off in, in the foreground um, and the background's completely gone as well. Now, when, we, when I've got my first X-Series, I used to shoot with the D800 and the D3 Nikon. Now, because they're optical viewfinders, getting down low was always a bit hit and miss. You could use live view, but again, it just slowed the camera down. When I got my X-T1, um, you had the flippy screen. Now everyone laughed at me saying, oh, that's a bit ridiculous, that's a bit amateurish. But now, you know, for getting this sort of shot, you cannot lie down in the pit lane. It's a, it's forbidden, dangerous. You know, 60 cars at Le Mans, 36 cars in the European Le Mans series. Um, cars are coming in and out of the pit lane at all times. You cannot be lying down in the pit lane. Uh, you'll get thrown out, simple as, it's dangerous. So to get down low, you can put the camera with a view, viewfinder upright, so it's like a waist level viewfinder, so you're shooting at a low angle. You don't need to lie down, which is great. So you can get shots like this. Also, there are certain parts of the track where you are either above or below um, the track drops down or comes up a hill. <clears throat> so this is, this is in Shanghai. This is turn two, turn three, and they're coming down the hill towards you. So the position is quite close to the edge of the track and I'm shooting uphill. So again, I'm behind the barrier. The barrier is only one meter high, so I'm, I'm behind the barrier, shooting as low as I possibly can and the cars are coming around the corner so I'm following focus as they come around the corner I'm follow focusing them and then when they get to the right point the car's slightly hopping over the curbs and then shooting two or three frames as they come around the corner so but you can see I'm down below the below the cars and I put the cars purposely at the top of the frame to get that effect Right, shooting at night, as I alluded to earlier, um, it, that's even more difficult. Um, it causes, a, there's a lot of um, challenges for shooting at night. Light is obviously one consideration. You've got to shoot where there is some ambient light. You know, we don't shoot with flash um, because the cars are usually too far away. So, but on our cars, we've got headlights. So you've got lots of headlights. So if you've got one or two cars following each other, like that poor shot I showed you earlier, the car in front is being lit by the car behind. So you have that ambient light. You've also got flood lighting. Now this is Le Castellet, a uh, poor car circuit probably around in the south of France. Uh, we did a night race there in July. And, so, and um, it, it's, we've got lots of flood lighting. So what you're doing is looking for the pools of light. The problem is auto, um, autofocus can be upset. Also, so can auto exposure. So I tend to shoot all times, even during the day, I shoot with manual exposure. The reason I shoot manual exposure, especially at night, is if the car comes round and the headlights come into the, into the lens, your, auto, your exposure is going to go down. It's going to make it darker because it's thinking there's a lot more light coming into the camera. It's going to sh up, the, up the shutter speed or sh which are, whatever you're shooting, um, either up the shutter speed or make the aperture smaller. Um, so you've got to be careful. So what I tend to do is I tend to shoot manual, set it so when it comes around there, so any stray light isn't going to upset the, uh, the exposure settings. Um, you don't want lights head on. I've got another shot I'm going to show you in a minute. You don't want the headlights showing because all you'll just get is flare out. It'll be just white because you'll have all the lights coming into the camera. So side on shot, slightly above, slightly below is fine. This shot was done. I said there's a car out of shot here. We're putting some light in here. You've got a floodlight behind me and you've got the, it had been raining as well. So you've got a bit of um, uh, shine on the, on the, on the, on the track itself. So it's a, it's a nice shot. You can, it is slightly grainy. I think that's 1600 ISO. Um, don't be afraid to push the ISO. It, they're really, it's really, really good. Um, I'll go up to 6400. I try to keep it as low as possible, but you know I'm not afraid to push it to 6400 without any issues. Um, I don't tend to go above that, but at 6400 is is fine. Um, but I think it was 1600 or 800 uh, with the f2 and f2.8 lenses, and you can you you've got a lot of flexibility. Now this is a shot I was talking about, head-on shot at Le Mans. I'm, now you can see the lights are flaring slightly 
Um, I'm actually slightly above. There's a Marshall post above so I could use. So I'm slightly shooting down at an angle. If I was down at the track side, that would just be complete flare out. So I wouldn't be able to get that shot at that angle. Um, the only problem with this shot is autofocus is going to be a bit tricky. Um, the flare of the lights tend to confuse the autofocus system. Not just Fujifilm, it's every autofocus system gets confused because there's no contrast, there's no, it, it just screws it up. So what you can do in this situation is you can pre-focus on the track. Um, wait for the cars to get to a certain point on the track and then they and then just fire two or three frames as it goes through the point it's pre-focusing and let it come through the cars are going at you know quite a fast speed through here so two or three shots is all you need one or two are going to come out again it's at night so I'm shooting I think it was 500 of a second at f2 I took the converter off for this shot so I'm shooting at f2 um, wide open so I'm getting about 500 it's for about an 800 or 1600 ISO so it's it's doable you get really nice shot and I, what I was also looking for was a car following behind to give this silhouette of the car in front because if that car wasn't there you wouldn't get the silhouette you just get the lights you also get the wonderful look on the track as well so it's seeing the image um, and looking for the right combination of cars if you like at night because you do get single cars going around and you just uh, ignore them because you, if you take a shot it ain't going to work so you wait for the two the train of cars the two three four train of cars to come through um, to get the shot don't be afraid to shoot other things rather than just race cars um, we're trying to tell a story as professionals we're trying to tell a story so we don't ignore the fans we don't ignore the drivers the drivers are in helmets the drivers are in the cars so we don't see them at work or rarely do we see them at work so what we try and do is capture the ambience from outside pit lane i'm in the pit lane a lot shooting mechanics shooting the other drivers we have three drivers per car so the other two drivers are out on the pit wall talking to their engineers watching or sleeping or whatever so they're doing other things so you can get pictures of them that sit the mechanics working on the car if the cars come in for a reason there's a problem you can see the the, the, the mechanics working on the cars but you've also got the fans. These guys are sort of Toyota supporters, um, as you can probably tell. <laughs> um, this was in Le Mans a couple of years ago. You've got mechanics. This is historic Formula 3, which I did. Um, this is checking out one of the engines on one of the historic Formula 3 cars. Um, so you've got this sort of thing. This was taken on a 16 mil 1.4, so you could get in close. Um, but again, looking varying the angles varying things prime lenses are great i'll go through again what primes and zooms what i use but i if i want to if i've got more time i'll use a prime with a wide aperture to to give me a bit more um creativity if you like there's also the entertainment this is in bahrain one of the bandsmen in the bahrain on the on the grid and then you've got the the champagne shot the celebration shot at the end of the race uh, which we get a lot of these this was Le Mans um, now autofocus again these situations can be a problem because when the champagne's going over especially when it's backlit like the, the Le Mans podium is backlit if the sun is out it's always like this it's wonderful but you tend to lose the focus on the driver it tends to go for the champagne so what we tend to do is um, and they're moving around as well so you can't just put it on manual focus and leave it on the driver's face because he's moving up and down running around spraying champagne everywhere so you can't do that so you need to rely on your autofocus system what we have got on the xt series is the ignore obstacles afc custom function which is fantastic it does a really really good job it's not 100 percent perfect but it does get allow me to get shots like this because it's ignoring the uh, spray it's concentrating on the driver's face um or the yeah i was focused on the driver's face on that point but you can see the the sprays across his face but it still kept the focus on his face not on the champagne so it does work i'd say not 100 percent, but it does work so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to talk about some of the gear that i use okay so i shoot with a pair of xt4s i have an xt2 and x pro 2 as well um they're my reserve cameras if you like i I had them when they, were, when they were new. I had XT. I had a pair of XT3s as well. Um, I sold the XT3s to get the XT4s. Now, a little bit of a thing here. Some people think as ex-photographers we get given gear. We do not get given gear. All right. 
we get a discount as part of our deal with Fujifilm, but we do not get given gear. If the X-Series doesn't work, I wouldn't be using it, simple as. I can tell you it works because I use it for my living. I put my money where my mouth is and I buy all my gear. My camera gear is full of gear that I, I have bought myself, not given to me by Fujifilm. So let's get that one out of the way straight away. So when we got the X-T3s, fantastic. Step up from the X-T2, uh, loved it a bit, uh, thing. Video, I do a lot of video for my, my clients. Um, and in fact, I'm doing more and more video now for my clients. And I found hand holding the X-T3 was a bit of a problem. So I bought an X-H1. Uh, H1 has got a few foibles. It's a great camera, but I love the shape of it. I love the size of it, but it was only 4K 13, whereas the X-T3 was 4K 60. And there were certain things on the X-T3 video function, which were much better than the than the X-H1, but the H1 had IBIS, so you could handhold it. So I had this combination of cameras. X-T4 came out, tried it before it was launched, loved it, and then, so I bought two of them. One's my video camera and one's my stills camera. I do use the video camera for stills as well, <clears throat> but it's primarily my video camera, um, which is the one I'm shooting on, this, I'm shooting this video on. It is superb, and for hand holding it, you can hand hold it without any problems at all. You get a little bit of shake, but you know you can get rid of that in post. Whereas the XT3, in, you know, the, especially with using the 1655 f2.8, which is non-stabilized, it's a non-stabilized zoom lens. I had I had to be careful when I was using the XT3, so I had a gimbal which I used for mainly for the XT3. So, if you are only shooting stills. I need to get this out of the way. If, I, if you're only shooting stills, you do very little video, the X-T3 is a brilliant camera, especially now with the new firmware update. It's got most of the X-T4's um, benefits, shall we say. Um, so if you shoot mainly stills, don't think you've got a second best camera. The X-T4 has got certain advantages, IBIS being one of them. The longer battery life is a big plus for me. Um, I have to have carry less batteries with me than the old W126S's. Um, and you've got the 15 frames per second on the mechanical shutter, which again is a bonus. It's, I'm not a, what we call a, a, a spray and pray photographer, you know, just go keep blasting away until you get one decent shot. But it is useful having 15 frames a second. If something happens in front of you, I know I can get, you know, a sequence of shots, or if I, you know, a start shot, I can then just fire it. I tend to most of the time is have two or three shots. Boom, 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 boom. That's how I shoot. Um, but it's useful having it on 15 frames a second. So if you don't need any of that, if you think the X-T3 is in, you have got a really, really good camera. It's the same sensor. So it's a 26 megapixel sensor, x trans 4. So it's a great thing. But I only sold it, sold my T3s because I need the video functions of the, of the T4. My main lens for sport is the 200 f2. Um, I'll be honest with you, I asked, I went into a meeting in Fuji Film Tokyo uh, a few years ago with some of my colleagues from the X, X Photography Program. We asked for a long, a long telephoto prime lens, fast one. So we got the XT, the XF 200 f2 in um, 2018. I bought one of the first ones to come in the UK because I just loved it so much. I had the 100 400. Um, I actually sold the 100 400, but I'll go into the 104 in a minute. But the 200 mil gives me a 1.4 times converter with the 1.4 converter it gives me a 280 f2.8, which is equivalent to a 420 uh, f2.8 in full frame terms. Now that's the standard lens for most sports photographers, but I have the option of taking the 1.4 converter off and I've got a 300 f2 equivalent, which is great. I also have the two times converter, which does degrade the image slightly but the shot I took of the Porsche in Bahrain on the corner sideways with the, the head-on shot, that was taken on the 200 with the two times converter on it. It's a really good. If you stop down to f f4 f5.6, f it would be just start stop down one stop. It sharpens up really nicely. Even wide open, it's not that bad. Um, so it's it's very usable. But it's not a match converter, so I tend to not use it unless I really need it. But that gives me a 600 f4 equivalent. So, you know, within one lens, I've got three, three lenses. Now, when we talk about crop factor, I see a lot of the chatter on the internet about F2 not being F2 because it's a crop frame. Now, when you talk about depth of field, that's correct. It's not the same as an F2 on a full frame. You, get, you will get shallow depth of field from an F2 or an F2.8 
on a full frame than you will on a crop frame. However, when you're a sports photographer, especially if you're shooting in a floodlit stadium, it's all about light gathering. So an F2, when you're talking about light gathering, is an F2. It's the same as an F2 on a full frame. So your, if you want to shoot stadium, which I'll show you some shots in a bit from rugby, um, you know, you're shooting at a thousand a second to freeze the action. Your, your aperture is wide open because you have to keep it wide open to get made. So your ISO is the defining factor, you know, is your variable. So if you're shooting with an F2, you are keeping the ISO lower than if you're shooting with a 2.8 or an F4 or a 5.6. I've shot stadium with 100, 400, F5.6. So I'm shooting three stops slow, lower than I would. So I'm shooting, say, so I'm shooting 6,400, I'm shooting 800 ISO for the same, thing, for the same um, exposure comp, um, shutter speed and aperture. So, you know, that's the difference when you're shooting with an F2 lens and it is about light gathering. When you're talking about sports photography, it, you do have the depth of field as well, but when you do light gathering, so just wanted to clear that up. 200 f2 is a fantastic professional level lens but it also has a price tag to match you know, you know i will admit it for what you get for it it is value huge value for money you compare the canon and nikon offerings and just have a look on one of the websites and see what you get it is bang for buck it's the same or better than however the, luckily in the x series system we do have the 100 400 which i was lucky enough to be part of the test team for um, and bang for buck it is the best telephoto lens out there you know um, it, if you're a sports photographer a wildlife photographer and you shoot on the x-series get 100 400 the downside is obviously the 5.6 on the long end which does limit you when you're shooting in low light but you have this 150 to 600 mil equivalent focal length also you have a 1.4 converter that will go on it um, which will give you even further which is up to equivalent of 840 mil in, in full frame terms you can fit a two times to it i don't recommend it i've tried it it doesn't work and then to be honest 840 mil equivalent 560 mil uh, in things should be long enough for anybody um, for 99.9 percent .9 of the time you need it so 100 400 is a really good lens the other telephoto lenses to look at are the th new 75 300 the 55 200 and of course the 5140 f2.8 uh, I own the 50, 5140. When I went, when I moved from the Nikon system across, the one lens that I was really upset about losing was the 7210 f2.8, and this is the equivalent. And this, the Fujinon lens, is a is brilliant, absolutely stunning lens. Short telephoto, you can fit the converter to it. It works really well with the two times. Um, I was shooting last weekend with the two times on it, um, and it's a very flexible, makes it a very flexible lens. Um, 5500, I owned it when it first came out because the 5140 wasn't available. Um, it's great, it's a, it's a compact lens, it's, it is optically, it's brilliant. AF is slower, but you're paying much less money for it. But it is, for what you get, it's a very compact lens. Um, but the you know, downside is it can't take the converters. I haven't tried the new 75-300, but for the reports I've seen, it's brilliant. It does take the converters. So, and again, it's a 300 mil at the long end. It's 5.6 again, but you've got three, it's 300 millimeter, which is 400 and 450 mil equivalent. So you're gonna have the pulling power for sport or photography. So I would look at that lens. Again, I don't know, I haven't tried it myself, but again, it's an option that's just been launched uh, by Fujifilm. I also have the 1655-28, which is my standard lens on the thing. Uh, with the X-T4, now that's stabilized. Uh, great. I have the 10-24 F4. I keep getting asked why I haven't got the 8-16 F2.8. Um, I also teach landscape photography up here in Scotland where I live. Um, and I can't, I don't want to buy another set of filters. So I've stuck with the 10-24. I've actually got on the shelf behind me the new 10-24, um, the new Mark II, which is weather resistant, which is what I've been looking for. Um, and it's got the aperture ring is marked. So I'm gonna try it out in Bahrain um, in the next race. So I'll let you know how we we'll get on with that. But it's a, it looks like it, the, the 1024, the Mark I version is, I've had it six years and it's been through the mill. It does the job brilliantly. I have a set of primes. I have the 90 mil F2. Um, again, why do I have the 90 mil F2 when I got the 5140? f2 that's the reason it's a it's again it's a great lens it's got that shallower depth of field it's a different look to it than the 5140 so that's why i've got both in my camera bag i have the 35 mil f14 
Um, it's a lovely lens. I don't, I've used it very rarely, I'll be honest with you, but I do have it in the bag because it, it's got that organic look. It's just fantastic. I have the 18mm f2, which are the two, those two are the two lenses I had when I bought the X-Pro1 in 2013. Um, I had the three primes. I got rid of the 60mm, but I kept the 35 and the 18mm. Both are great. The 18mm is so small. You can just stick it in your pocket and go. But I also have the 16mm 1.4. Um, again, it's the 1.4 the, the thing. I also have a Samyang 8mm um, for the thing, which is a great little lens. Uh, the, I bought it before the 8mm on the 18, 8 to 16 came out. But it, again, it's a, it's a manual focus lens, but to be honest, when you're shooting with it, anything beyond one meter is going to be in focus anyway. But that's a great for getting inside cars. So if you've got on the grids and you can shoot in the cockpit, you know, we'll get open one of the doors, get the car driver post view slightly and then get out again or you're in a garage and you want you're in a tight position the 8 mil is great but most of the time the 10 mil end is is perfect on the 1024. I also tried the new 51 f1 at Le Mans this year um, I found it to be I used to have the 56 1.2 but I sold it because the autofocus wasn't that good on it and I prefer a longer lens when I'm working the 50 mil again I found the, the focal length slightly I can't get close enough you've got to stand back from the cars when they're working um, when they drive the, the teams are working on the cars so you don't want to get too close so I found it a little bit thing but one of the bits I did use it on superb absolutely stunning and the autofocus is so fast on it it's just locks in straight away um, I can see this lens not so much for me um, but I can see wedding photographers portrait photographers lapping this up I would recommend it over the 56 1.2 um, if you can afford it because obviously the price is, is a bit of a difference in price but the f1 it's impressive really impressive I'm just going to go through some camera settings now um, I do work in a specific way with my cameras um, I did borrow a Nikon a couple of years ago a Nikon D500 because I said I used to shoot Nikon D3 D800 D700 D300 S's and I just wanted to try it out and I'll be honest with you I hated it the simple fact is I've got so used to a, an electronic viewfinder and seeing in the viewfinder what I'm shooting um, exposure wise I can't go back I found it very difficult to go back to an optical viewfinder um, it's 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 just the way I work now so when I when I'm shooting I'm I'm looking at the exposure in the viewfinder. So I'm controlling it, as I said before, I shoot manual manual exposure. So on my dials, I've got the shut, top shutter dial set to T and it's locked off. I'm using the rear dial to set my shutter speed. So I can control the shutter speed on my rear dial. The, all, the ISO dial is set to C on the, on, the, um, on the X-T4 or A on the X-T3. And I'm using the front dial, command dial, to change the ISO. The aperture is obviously on the aperture ring. So I can control all three elements swiftly. On the thing. And I'm looking through the EVF. So I haven't got to take my eye away from the EVF. So that is how I work. So I'm seeing what the, what the camera is seeing, what the exposure is going to be, what the, um, how it's going to look. Thing. So that's why I can't go back to a, um, a, an optical viewfinder. On the X-Pro2, I very rarely use the optical viewfinder anymore. Um, I tend to use the electronic viewfinder. That's the way I work. I have optical stabilisation on, even if I'm panning or whatever, I'm, it's all, always on. It never, it doesn't fight the camera anymore. It used to, the T2, it did used to fight. Um, I did have a problem. H1 was terrible when it first came out. Um, I, for video, I had to send it back and it got, they did an upgrade on it. Um, and it, they got it within a couple of weeks it was fine but you know there is no fight now you don't have to switch it on and off you, even on a tripod I must admit a couple of times I've forgotten when I've been shooting on a tripod to switch it off and I've had no problems with shake or anything like that you know it doesn't I would leave it on all the time I have the metering set to center weighted um, basically because normally it's in the middle so I can it the camera is metering for the center autofocus if you're tracking obviously auto uh, afc continuous um if you're shooting on t3 or t4 i always have to set to boost anyway and that's more to do with the fact that the evf is all speeded up etc if you're shooting on t2 switch it to boost your batteries will drain faster but and not that much but it will improve the autofocus time as well um so autofocus custom function functions for afc i tend to use three 
set three, which is accelerating, decelerating subjects, or set two, which is ignore obstacles. Um, I have a custom function which as well if I get into a situation, but those two functions tend to, tend to be my go-tos, um, depending on what I'm shooting. Sometimes I get cars that come over the top of a rise and appear slightly, so set four, but again, it tends to pick it up quite quickly on the set three, so I don't tend to bother with the set four for the, rapid, for the appearing subject. Um, autofocus points. Now, I'd never use the full multi-frame. I do for video, um, but I don't use it for stills. I tend to use single point if I want to be accurate or zone, which is through, and I always said it's a zip three, three and move it around the frame. Um, but I never use multi, the full frame thing, because it tends to pick up something you don't want it to pick up on, which is sometimes at the most inopportune moment. I set the drive to CH high rate. Um, it's 11 on XT3, it's 15 on on T4. I have the CL setting on the T4 set to eight frames. So the th problem you've got is if you're shooting a lot of frames, you've then got to go through it later. So you, you know, you, in, in the post edit, so you don't want to be shooting thousands of frames unnecessarily. So my, the reason I shoot CH is if something happens in front of me, I can follow it and, and get a car crashing or car going off into the into the gravel. I can then follow it boom, 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 as it goes. My way of shooting is three frames, boom, 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 boom. I don't tend to spray. So CH is my normal setting, but I do sometimes with the X-T4 now set it to CL. So it's set to eight frames, which tends to be fast enough. And if something does happen, it's fast enough. Um, but I'm not burning lots of frames to then I've got to sort them out later when I get back to the thing. So that's my settings um, on the cameras. So you have to set it up yourself. As I say, it's like driving a car. You set it up how you how you want to set it up, but that that's what works for me. Um, and I've got the option if I need to to set the dial back to from C from T to A, or set it onto a shutter speed and then put it onto A on the on the thing. So I've got shutter priority or aperture priority. But I'll be honest with you, I very rarely do that now. I used to do that a lot a few years ago, but now not at all. So now I'm going to I'm going to talk about some of the other sports I talked you know I've done uh, to give you a bit of an idea. First thing first, unlike motorsport, if you're going to do a team sport or I think contact the organizer before you go, especially if it's a stadium, even a small stadium, if you will contact the organizer to so make sure you can take a camera into the event. If you're going to uh, the local uh, playing fields to watch uh, the kids football or whatever. Um, don't worry too much about it. But if you're going into a stadium environment, you need to be able to be able to set the camera. Some stadiums do not allow cameras in unless you know, they'll accept the phones, but they won't. If you turn up with a camera, they'll probably turn you. It could turn you away. Um, so it's best thing. Also, if you talk to them, you might get a better. You might get better access. Um, if you say what you're trying to do, you're trying to build a portfolio, etc. They might say, well, okay. Um, we'll let you come in to do some of the pre-match stuff or whatever, do some portraits or whatever, in return for a few shots to you, we can use in the next programme or whatever. And I, I recommend you do that if you get a chance to do that, because it's helping you, it's helping them, and you get better access. So, you know, it, you, you don't ask, you don't get. So we're going to talk about canoe slalom. Now, I it's a sport that I love. I used to be, back in the 90s, when I first started, 95, 96, I was the official photographer of the British canoe slalom team ahead of the 1996 Olympics in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, I didn't get to go to Los Angeles, but I did get to go to some of the high-profile events, the qualifying events in the UK. So, and I also covered the World Championships in Nottingham that year. Um, so it was a thing. It was a bit like what I talked about just now about you know talking, giving free free pictures. It was a basically a way of building my portfolio. Uh, they didn't pay me. Um, it was a thing, but I did earn money off the access that I got because obviously I was selling images to certain magazines and because it was the Olympics that year, there was a lot of interest, and there were a lot. And as it turned out, there were quite a few gold medals uh, won by the British team that year. So. Um, so we went. So one of the best tips is this shot here. If you haven't shot um, canoe slalom, go. It's you know look on the British Canoe Slalom website and find your local event and go. If you can go to a natural course rather than a man-made course, it actually looks better because it's a, a river. If you go to a man-made course, it's usually concrete uh, with Teesside, Pont near Nottingham. Uh, but you can get some good shots. But if you go to a natural course. You have the problem if the river level is too low or too high, then um, they can cancel the event. 
so whereas the man-made courses can be controlled. Now this is a what I call a standard shot taken on a uh, on a turn. Now in canoe slalom there's a lot of water, it's there's a lot there's a lot of spray, there's a lot of action, they're not going that fast, but when they're going down the course, yes they pick up speed, but they have to go through a set of gates. Now there are down gates and up gates. Up gates they slow down because they're going up against the flow. So if you can you can position yourself on one of these up gates as they turn to go back down the thing they get this you get this effect you get them leaning into the into the camera so again your autofocus can pick it up quite quickly um, if you can't autofocus if there is a problem with the autofocus focus on the pole as the turning pole and as they come round the pole you can then shoot as well but I tend to use autofocus with these cameras because they're really good again lots of spray so you want to use that ignore obstacles function on the custom settings and this is the shot you can see what I mean this is a shot I did um, going it was a, the rapids and I positioned myself near these rapids because I wanted this shot now as he came through you can see there's so much spray Again, people have asked me, have I, have I used flash on this? You cannot use flash. This is one, one sport you are banned from using flash. You cannot use flash. So this was actually, um, this was a, a Grand Tully in, in Perthshire on the River Tay, up in Scotland. And the light is actually from behind. The sunlight is coming from behind. The bank on the far side is in, in shadow. And you've got this fantastic thing so your, your exposures you've got to be really careful because obviously there's a lot of white water now the good thing about white water is it's acting like a reflector so that you know there's no here on the on the paddler's face it's actually like a reflector the sun is being bounced back off the water back into his face so i didn't need to use flash anyway um but you can see very high shutter speed i think that might be in a four thousandth of a second two thousandth minimum really to get the sort of frozen water coming off the the spray coming off but again you can see the the focus is on the face not on the on the water because i've used the ignore obstacles head-on shots you can see there's a there's this the red gates are the up gates the green gates are the other so he's just come through the green gate and he's heading for an up gate to go around that gate there but again you can see them dropping down i've got the water coming underneath high shutter speeds and then another one going through some down gates you can see there's a rock there so she's going to try and head for around that rock to get down through those rapids but that was on a 100 400 mil lens very very good lens eventing there's another thing i've done i used to work for a newspaper in lincolnshire um, and one and two of the events i used to have to cover every year was the burley horse trials and the belton house horse trials so i used to go there for the paper get my shots and come away but again on a media pass is great this is an event at Forgan Denny a friend of mine she's um, quite high up eventing an eventer um, and I went along to sort of take some pictures for a, 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 for her and also for a couple of articles I was writing on sports photography so this is a we have is a through the eventing has dressage show jumping and cross country show, cross country is the one you normally go for because it's the most photogenic but i quite like the show jumping arena now this was taken on a 1024 so i'm quite close to this fence now there's a rope around the around the thing you stay behind the rope don't cross the rope so but the fence was quite close so i got in this is probably on the 24 end to be honest at the 1024 but i got down low using the view the, the viewfinder so the lcd upright so i could use it like a waist level viewfinder got it in the grass and as, as she came over i got the shot so high again 500 of a second a thousand of a second making sure you freeze the action show jumping um, show jumping this is the uh, cross country and this is the water jump now panning panning is you can is a technique you can use on this as well um but unlike motor car racing cars who are going straight and don't tend to do that horses are doing that and that so you get a lot of movement vertically as well as horizontally so you, again you it's a bit more it's double the problem this was taken at 60 the second but it gives you the effect and certain parts of the horse are are sharp and you've got this wonderful spray off the off the water as it's going through the water heading for the jump ears are pricked up it's a nice shot i quite like that one and then you've got the head on um over the jump uh shot now this was taken on a 90 mil f2 because you could get quite close to the fences i was shooting with a with a with the with the f2 rather than the, the 5140 f28 
you can see the background is completely thrown out of focus on the you know, Perthshire countryside behind. It's a, it's a beautiful part of the world and you get shots like that. Again, no flash. Do not use flash. It upsets the horses. So um, thing. talk to the there's officials on each fence. So if you talk to the officials and make sure you're okay where you're standing, everything's fine. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is rugby. Um, this is a sport I love. I've played the game. I love shooting the game. I go as a spectator as well. It's just something I know. It's what I was talking about earlier about being, knowing your subject. Rugby is my, my game. All right, so I've shot different levels over the years from club level up to international and it's a sport that I absolutely adore. Again, if you want to you know, choose your venue carefully, now this shot here was taken at a local club here, up here in East Lothian. Uh, this is North Berwick, one of my local clubs. It's in a park, so you have no restrictions as far as going into a stadium. You can stand next to the touchline, you can do what you more or less what you like where you go, and but the access is very good however you have to be careful with backgrounds because when you're in a park you've got parked cars you've got play equipment you've got all sorts of stuff you know bins you know sort of recycling bins um, they can cause distractions in the background so you have to choose your positions quite carefully if you have got a bright yellow wheelie bin in the backdrop turn it into a black and white you know get rid of the color and you take that away, you get take that, uh, that distraction element away. But if you can choose your position carefully, um, you can get shots that are with a pretty clean background. This was done on a 100-400, so you know you can see the background is pretty much blurred um, with this one. Now the other thing to be careful of, if you are shooting at a club level, you can stand quite close to the touchline. However, be careful when the, the players are running in a, a ball, running a try, or they're um, they're trying to bundle a, a player into touch. They're not going to worry about you standing there. You have to worry about what they're doing. And if you get hit by a 16, 17 stone forward, you're going to know about it. So be careful. Um, it's not so bad when you're shooting at a stadium because you're behind, you're further further back. Um, but yeah, just be careful with that one because it, it's happened to me. However, I shoot, also shoot, international level this is Murrayfield um, this is Scotland versus Fiji and uh, in the days when we had spectators when we were allowed to have spectators um, 60,000 people the backgrounds are going to be fairly clean you get the odd um, steward with a bright yellow coat on or whatever um, but most of the time the backgrounds are pretty pretty good they're just full of sea of faces that's the whole point this was taken on the 200 mil F2 you can see the background compared to the previous shot the background is a lot more blurred um, the, the separation between the background and the subject is a lot better um, what I love about this shot is you can see the faces now what I said about sport the motorsport earlier drivers being in helmets and then being inside a car you can't see them rugby it's on full display um, you can see the guy the Fiji guy blooming um, pointing out he doesn't realize that Scotland have already scored and you can see the faces of the guys on the ground and they put and put another try over, over the line so um, it's all about action it's all about the 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 the, the grit and determination of the players so um, yeah it's it's fantastic now this is inside a stadium so what I was talking about earlier about light gathering the f2 this is where it came into thing I'm shooting probably I always keep my lens uh, my camera set to a thousand a second if I can um, I dropped the 800 at the lowest but thousand is usually my thing so I'm shooting wide open on the aperture so the ISO the ISO is this one's going to be about 800 if I was shooting on the 100 400 um, which is more flexible to be honest um, but you're shooting on I'm shooting 6400 you know maybe 3200 if I'm lucky but I'm 6400 or even 8000 um, so your ISO is a lot higher so it's a lot grainier um, so you, it's a horse for courses. That's why we all shoot fast, fast telephotos, because of the wide apertures. The next shot is Tommy Seymour diving in. Now I actually mucked up on this shot. Um, what I do is when the, when I have the 1.4 converter on the 200 when they're outside the 22 line. If you know rugby, it's the line that the, the, they come come towards the post. You've got the line across the pitch, and the 22. So if it's anything beyond the 22. Um, it's I put the if they come inside the 22, I take the converter off. Now it's obviously I get quite I get quite quick at it, but 
it's a fast moving sport and sometimes you get caught out. Now I was actually shooting with the 1.4 on it and suddenly Tommy broke through. He was nearly tackled by the guy that's over the, over the floor here, but as he was standing up, I didn't have time to set the 1.4 converter. That's where the 100-400 would have come in handy, but because of the aperture, I wasn't didn't have it. So I was lucky he dived over the line because while he was running towards the camera, um, he was I was missing the legs or missing the head because he was too tight. And then luckily he dived across the line. So I actually got this shot, about three or four shots as he dived across the line. And as he slid across the grass, and then when he stopped and he, he did the celebration. So I got all that, but I actually didn't get the run in because it was, it was, it was too, the, the frame was, it was frame filling. So there is a downside to a telephoto, but you know, it's, it's the old one, but I got that shot. So I'm quite pleased with that. Um, I know this is what I was talking about. You know, you get the set plays where they try and run through. Um, that's when you can anticipate a bit more, but it, say rugby, rugby union, especially, you do get these breaks and they do break through. So um, it's, it is knowing your, it's knowing your subject and, it's, but you do get caught out every so often. So anyway, that's all for me. Thank you for watching. Um, if you have any questions, please, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook. My um, website is w is mclanephotographic.com and all the the um, social media links are there. So if you want to get in touch and ask any questions, please do. Um, I'm happy to do that. Thank you very much for your time and uh, good luck. <laughs>